Thanks for taking the time to listen to this weekly sermon from Southside Baptist Church in Florence, South Carolina. Our vision is to know Him and to make Him known. Please visit our website at southsidenow.church so you can find out more about how we are helping to make and grow disciples in the Florence area. For now, sit back and take in today's message from God's Word. Amen. Let's give our applause to Jesus Christ. So glad to have you here this morning. And um, for everyone watching online, we're so glad that you could join us. Hope you'll uh, come and be a part of our services here, here soon. Um, Alexander the Great, when he was on his Conquer the World tour, he would go to the gates of the city in which he wanted to conquer, and he would light a candle. He would put it right at the gate, and he would let them know that as soon as that candle burned out, he was going to take that city. He was going to march through that gate, and it was going to be his. And that they had a choice at that point in time. As that candle burnt, they had a choice. And the choice was this. The choice is that they could bend the knee to him, or they could lose their lives. They could lose their lives. Now, whether we think about this, and sometimes we don't like to think about death, we don't like to think about our time being limited here on earth, the fact is, is we have a candle that's burning in our soul, in our heart. And one day, this body right here is going to fail. It won't, it won't, it won't be able to live any longer. Every one of us. Now, maybe, maybe, maybe you get to uh, 40 years of age. Maybe it's 30 years of age. Maybe it's, it's 70. Maybe it's 100 if you're lucky. I don't know how long you have here on earth. We all have a candle burning. And at one point or time in our life, in our life, we have a choice to bend the knee and to praise Jesus for who he is and to humble ourselves and to come to him like a child comes to him and saying, you are my God, you are my Savior, and repent of our sins. Or we can continue on. We can continue on. Living how we want to live. Living our lives for more comfort, for more things, to fill our garages up with more and more and more. You know, I, I, I love that show, American Pictures. You ever watch that show, American Pictures? You've, you've seen that, American Pictures? And it's amazing. You go up, they go on some of these uh, properties, and they just have barns and garages and garages just full of stuff. Some of it's junk. Some of it is it's pretty neat. And it's interesting when Mike and Frank go in there, how they can kind of pick and see what things are valuable in the midst of all the junk. I tell you, in this life, there's a lot of junk you got to filter through. There's a lot of junk you got to filter through. But there's someone called Jesus who is of great worth. Amen? He is of great worth. And if you haven't found him, I pray that you find him. Maybe you have religion. Maybe you know all the right answers. But do you have the most precious thing that is in this world? It's Jesus. Amen? Say it with me. Jesus. That's the most precious thing. And so one day the candle is going to burn out. And your choice, your choice will be made whether you have deliberately made it or ignored your choice. You know, some wonder, some wonder, is this, is this as good as it gets? Right here. Maybe you've wondered that yourself. Is this as good as it gets? The answer is yes to those who refuse to bend the knee. And to claim Jesus and repent of their sins. Yes, if you refuse to bend your knee, to humble yourself to Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you here uh, this morning, this is as close as to heaven as what you're going to get. Now, I have some good news. I have some good news. Is that if you are a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of him, this is the closest to hell you'll deal with. Amen? I like that. I like that. Think of your, the, the, the best day you've ever had in your life or the best day that you could have in your life. And that's just a little bit of a glimpse of how great and awesome heaven's going to be. But think of the worst day you've had in your life. And I'm sure that we've had some bad ones. 
We've had some bad ones. Your, your, your worst day of your life may not even come yet. But that's, that's as close to a believer will ever come to, to, to dealing with hell. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that. You see, I want you to know here this morning, what you believe about death and eternity, it will determine how you live. It will determine how you live. For example, atheists believe that in death, it's over. There's no eternity. And so if you're an atheist, you just believe you're dead. You're, you're, you're worm dirt. You're pushing daisies. That's, that's it. There's no reason to live for any eternal motivation whatsoever. For people who believe in purgatory, they believe that once you die, you can pray, they can pray you out of purgatory. If, if you know, you're, you're a, um, a, a fan of certain sports teams, you, you may believe you live in pur- purgatory, especially in Cleveland, right? I mean, up in there. Islam teaches that at the end, Allah will judge your good and your bad. And if your good works outweigh your bad works, and you'll get in. If your, if your bad outweighs your good, then, you, then you won't, you'll, you'll, you'll go to hell. Some people believe in, uh, that when you die, that you'll become an angel. And so some of you may think that when you become an angel, you're, you're, you've, you're going to get yourself a, a pair of wings, and it, it's going to look like one of those uh, fat, bald, naked baby angels playing a harp. On, on a cloud. If that's the case, and if you believe that, why eat right at all? I mean, seriously. Why have the desire to have the perfect body if you're just going to become a big, fat, naked angel, right? I mean, eat the cookies you want. Eat the ice cream you want. Just eat whatever you want. Who cares? I don't know. Maybe that's what you think. Some people believe in reincarnation. They think that if you've been really good, you'll come back as a higher life form. If you've been really bad, you'll come back as a cockroach or a mosquito or a cat or something like that. <laughs> but what you believe about death and eternity really does determine how you live. It also will determine who you worship. You see, you and I, we were designed to worship. Now, you may th- may say, I'm not really, I'm not one who, I really don't worship God. Maybe that's your your mindset. Uh, Maybe so, but you worship someone or something. I'll say it again. You worship someone. It could be yourself. It could be a sport. It could be a car. I don't know what it could be for you, but you are designed to worship. God made us that way, whether you believe that or not. And so if you're not worshiping him, you'll worship someone or something. You will. And so the question I want to ask and I want us to look at here this morning, we've been dealing with some difficult questions, and um, is the question this morning is this, is why would a loving God create a place called hell? Why would God, somebody put it this way, send someone to hell? It's a good question. It's natural, it's natural for people want to, uh, to have things turn out well in the end. In both life and in the afterlife. It's said in America that basically about 7 out of 10 Americans believe in a place called heaven. And close to 60% of people believe in a place uh, called hell. That um, they believe that people who have lived bad lives um, will go once they die where they are punished for eternity. Um, I was tickled a little bit last night. Um, you've been following the uh, March Madness, right? Oil out of Chicago. They're, they went to the Final Four, and they have uh, this nun named Sister Jean, and Sister Jean's kind of like their good luck charm. And, and I was watching some of the, the, um, the guys talking afterwards, some of the NBA players, and, and, um, and, and one of the, the, the uh, reporters asked Sister Jean, would you like to meet Charles Barkley? And she said, well... I have my limitations and what I'll deal with. And so it then went to Charles Barkley on the screen, and, and, and he's like, well, um, I, I figure my chances of getting into heaven are, are about 80-20. 20% chance I'll get into heaven, 80% chance I won't get into heaven. And so I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say anything bad at all about Sister Jean because I want to hold on to my 20% is what he is saying. And it got me thinking. How many people think like that? 
How many people think to themselves, well, I have a 50-50 shot. I have a 50-50 shot. I have a 50-50 chance of getting into heaven. Or it's 60-40. Or it's like Charles Barkley, I have a, I have a 20% chance. Let me make something very clear this morning. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You and I, we don't deserve heaven. In fact, when you come to read this book, this, the word of God, you come to realize that you deserve death and hell. That, that there is a 100% chance of that you are going to hell without humbling yourself and repenting of your sin and asking Jesus to save you, 100%. And so there's either a 100% chance you're going to hell or there's a 100% chance you're going to heaven because scripture says that you can know. Romans 8 talks about once we come to know Christ, that nor things present nor things to come can separate us from the love in which we find in Jesus. And so I don't know where you're at. If you're 80-20 here this morning or you're 50-50, it's time for you to make a, 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 the choice of it being 100% because Jesus offers grace and salvation this morning. And you can know, you can know for sure because we fall short. We fall short. We fall short. And so I'll say it. And, and um, this series is not so much a, or this, this sermon is not so much a, a sermon on the different things about hell and digging into Scripture. We, we did that, um, uh, I don't know, maybe a, a year ago, actually. We did a series called Afterlife. And we went kind of a little more in detail about hell. And you can check that out online. But today I want to focus on this question. Focus on, on, the, on this question. is why would a loving God create a place called hell why uh, why would a loving God send someone to hell it's a it's a good question it's a good question see we don't always realize the seriousness of our sin that's what really people are saying when they say well I got a 50 50 chance of getting you don't realize the seriousness of your sin you don't realize how much you and I we uh, uh, how how holy God is and who he is and and, and how um we are undeserving we are undeserving. And so here's the first thing I want you to know. It's in Luke chapter 12, if you'll turn with me. I want to show you something. These are the words of Jesus. And the first thing I want you to know is that you have a choice. You have a choice. Every single one of us, we have a choice. And in Luke chapter 12, verse 8 through 10, it says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, the Son of Man will also acknowledge in the presence of God's angels. But anyone who denies me here on earth will be denied before God's angels. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Last week we saw that faith is a choice. Listen, salvation is a choice. You have a choice to accept or reject Jesus. Jesus is saying that we will be claimed in heaven if we claim him down here on earth. We have a choice. Verse 10 has worried many believers. Um, the, un the, the, the unforgivable or unpardonable sin is attributing to the, uh, Satan the work that the Holy Spirit accomplishes. And, 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 and so um, I, I will back up here. Listen. There are some folks, and it's, it's unfortunate, because there are some folks who they know all the right things to say. They've, they know all the lingo. They are maybe even somewhat faithful in church, but their lives do not match up with being a child of God. Now, I realize none of us are perfect. We, we, we all struggle with sin. But you, you see, our, when we get saved, our want to, our desires change from wanting to serve ourselves to wanting to serve in God. And so, um, if we deny him with the way we live our lives, if we deny him here on earth and we are ashamed of Jesus Christ here on earth, it makes you wonder if you really got saved in the first place. Now, there's two people who know if you're saved, you and the Lord. But it makes you wonder 
where you're at in your walk with Him. And Jesus is saying that here to us here. He, he, he is telling us and showing us that we need to, if we acknowledge Him here on earth, He'll acknowledge us before the Father. He'll claim us. He'll claim us. You have a choice. You notice verse 10. And this, this has worried people for a long time. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will be forgiven. And there's different uh, debates of what this means. And you got theology books that say this, say that. This is my conclusion is this. Is that the Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to Jesus Christ. He's the one who convicts us of our sin. He's the one who guides the believer. Uh, the Holy Spirit woos us and brings us to Jesus Christ. You think about when you came to Christ, the first time that you heard the gospel. Maybe you accepted and accepted Jesus, but I know the first time, a couple times I heard the gospel, I, I, I rejected Jesus. I wasn't interested. I, I had to think on it, and maybe that was you. And so as we live our lives, we reject the Holy Spirit. We reject salvation. We reject the Holy Spirit. And maybe that's you here. We reject that. We feel that tug right in here to come to Jesus, to humble ourselves and come to Him and repent of our sins. We reject it and we reject it and we reject it. Our heart starts to become callous. It, 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 what, how we used to feel about when we adhere to the plan of salvation, we've ignored for so long. We've ignored our spouse. We've ignored what the preacher said. We've ignored what the Sunday school teacher said. We ignore, we ignore, we ignore. Until we come to a point in our life where death knocks on our door. And it's over. It's game over. There is no second chance. God has, through his Holy Spirit, has reached out to you and reached out to you. And you've rejected and rejected. And I believe at that time is when the unpardonable sin happens of rejecting the Holy Spirit. The blaspheming the Holy Spirit of living a life that's rejected and rejected the Holy Spirit of trying to lead us, lead us to Jesus Christ. See, you have a choice. We have a choice. And so, final scene number one is this, is that people don't have a choice. You want to know why oftentimes people will, will choose to believe this as well? They would rather blame God for all their difficulties in life. Because it's much easier to blame somebody else for your junk in your life, isn't it? That's what we do. It's easier to blame, well, so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that, and we don't want to take responsibility for where we find ourselves. And the fact is, the blame for our sin is all on us. It's much easier to try to blame God. It's much easier to try to blame someone else around us. We'd rather blame God, but the fact is, you have a choice. You also have a choice who you will worship Throw me over in Romans chapter 1. Romans 1. Everyone means everyone. We're going to see this here in Romans. Everyone has a choice of what they're going to do with the Lord. They do. They do. And we'll start in verse 18. We're going to read uh, uh, six verses here. And it says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful and wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, maybe you're not used to the Bible, and you may say, God, God shows his anger? Well, just, just follow here. You've got to read the rest of everything else and see why God gets angry. Because we do have a God who does get angry. Sin should make us angry. Amen? Um, there's things that should make us angry. Um, the support of abortion in our country should make us angry. Amen? There's sayings worth getting angry about. The Bible says, be angry in what? And sin not. There's sayings Christians really should get angry about. And uh, I don't get into politics too much. I read up here. But it makes me angry. And um, it makes me angry. And I, I tend to side more on the Republican side. Um, but it makes me angry when the Republicans play the abortion card and they pass a bill and they continue to fund Planned Parenthood, which butchers millions and millions of babies. There's something wrong with that. There's something worth getting angry over. Amen. Amen. We should, there's some things we need to get angry about in our country. And we should get angry about sin. We should get angry about politicians and folks speaking on both sides of their mouth and passing a bill we can't even afford as a country. Amen. That's good. That's good. That's true, and you know it. What's the answer? Well, Jesus is the answer. Let's move on. 
It is. Jesus is the answer. There's always something that we could get angry about. But get angry about the right kind of things. Get angry about what, what breaks, what, what God hates. Amen? Get angry. Get, get, get love what God loves. Hate what God hates. And if we did that more in our country, it, we wouldn't have all these discussions and, and bickering going about, back about what this party says and this party says and this party. My goodness, I don't know how some watch certain news channels any longer because it just gets a little crazy sometimes. Like, like what's the, it's Jesus. It's humbling yourself. Say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to love what God loves. I'm going to hate what he hates. But... Now, don't get me wrong here. Maybe you're here and you've had an abortion. I want you to know we, this church loves you. We care for you. God forgives. Amen. I'm glad he's a forgiving God. But if you think our country won't answer for the, the millions and millions of people that have been killed, then uh, you are greatly mistaken because God will show his anger at some point in time. This book does not center around the nation of the United States. And I love the United States. Amen? I love America. But it centers around Israel. Amen? It centers around Israel. All you got to do is go back and see when Israel started killing babies what happened. Cycle. 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 I don't know, I don't know what God's going to do. I don't know at a point in time. But he'll do something to get our attention. He will, and I believe he continues to bless America because of the Christian influence in the world and because of our support of Israel. That's why. Make no mistake about it. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. Well, let's just stop right there before we continue on. He has made it what? He has made it obvious. So we're going to see why God gets angry here about He's made it obvious, the truth obvious. Okay, next one. He's made it obvious. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. And so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Every person of adult age is without excuse the heavens declare the glory of God were without excuse. They're without excuse. If we really believe the gospel, if we really believe it, there's people who have never heard the name of Jesus. They've never had the gospel explained to them, but God has given enough light. He's revealed enough of himself, even just through creation, that it screams there's a creator. There screams there's a God. It screams that we are not a mistake. It's clearly seen. It's clearly seen. And God has showed it. He has showed it to us. And some will end up worshiping creation more than the creator. They do. They do. And so um, we have a God who's revealed himself to us in creation, in his word, and through a Jesus Christ. And, 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 and so and those are some of the main ways. So here, here's some of the things that people ask when we get on this subject. We get on this subject. Some ask, Okay, is hell a punishment for having broken God's standards, God's holy, or is a natural consequence of people living? Is it li natural consequence of people living uh, a life where they say, "I don't care if I'm separated from God. I want to do my own thing." And, and, and here's the answer: It's both. It's both. It is. It's punishment for the folks who say. I'm going to live my own life. I don't even care if there's a God. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to listen to the evidence or see the evidence. Um, and they, the heart gets hardened. Or simply just rejecting God's standard. You see, the worst part about hell is not the flames. Now, I know sometimes in, in Christian circles and in theology, some will say, well, hell's not really as hot as what we think it is. I think it's hot, for one. Um... It's not really as bad as what some think. There's different degrees of hell, and maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe, may, let's say they're right for a second. Just, just pretend. Let's pretend hell is, is um, more like going to a Holiday Inn versus like some resort for vacation or something like that. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. Hell is not going to be awful because there's flames there. Hell is not going to be awful because there's torment there. Hell is going to be awful because we are completely separated from God himself. And he has made the choice 
to, to separate himself from hell. That is what's going to be awful. The anguish of knowing and experiencing that, that we are completely separated from God. Because right now, right now, for the unbeliever, for if, you, if you're kind of trying to still figure this God thing out, I just want you to know, this is as close as you're going to experience the, the, the enjoyment in which God has given all of us. There's things that the, un, the, the unbeliever and the believer, we all enjoy and we all experience the good, the bad, and the ugly because God is good. And God is love. He is. But hell won't be awful just because of the flames. It's going to be because people will deeply grieve all they've lost. And hell is the final sentence that says you refuse regularly to live for the purpose in which you were made, to glorify and to worship God. That's what you were made for. That's what you were made for. To glorify and worship Him. Scripture goes on to tell us in 2 Thessalonians, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they will be punished with an everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord, from the majesty of His power. And some will ask, why can't, why can't God just make everyone go to heaven? It's a good question. Well, why can't he just make everyone a good heaven? See, if you were to force people to do something that was against their free choice, you would dehumanize them. That's what you would be doing. You would be, people would be nothing more than robots. If God gives free will, if he gives free will, he gives us a choice to accept or to reject the gospel, whether to go to a place called heaven or make the decision, a place called hell. And the Bible's clear, there's only one of two places. There's heaven, there's hell. There's no in between. There's not a second chance. Sorry. See, I feel there should be a second chance. Maybe I do too, but that's not what the word says. It's not what it says. It says we make our decision right here and now. Let me ask you this. Why, why would a loving God make you go to a place where he is after you have rejected and you've rejected the offer to go to heaven. Heaven will be great because God is there. And some have made it plain they have no interest in him while here on earth. Why would they have interest in him in heaven? Amen? You, 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 you've made it plain. So why, why would God make you do something like that? Why would a loving God make someone go to a place they clearly don't want to go? See, the rules that govern who goes to heaven and hell are established by God's nature. God is holy. He is perfect. Just as a campfire, by its own nature, is hot. If you were to drop something in that fire and you went to go to retrieve it, and that fire burns your hand, you're not going to get angry at the fire because you knew that, you sh that that fire would burn your hand and it would do damage because it, that, that fire within its nature is hot. And God is holy. And sin can't stay in his presence. It can't stay in heaven. He is holy and we are not. We're not. And so the fire and your hand are incompatible. Unholy things don't do well around a holy God. It's hard for us to grasp the power and awesomeness of God's glory and holiness. The only solution for a human to be in God's presence is this. It's for God to change us. So scripture tells us that he who knew no sin, being Jesus, became sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. I'm not going to heaven because I'm a pastor. I'm not going to heaven because I went to Bible college. I'm not going to heaven because I grew up in church. I'm going to heaven because there was a time in my life I realized I was a sinner and that I deserved hell and that God was holy and I'm not. And I needed my sin debt paid for. I needed to be forgiven. And I accepted, I accepted the gift of of salvation through Jesus. And if you haven't done that, my friend, I say this with, with, with all the love I can muster up. I really do. You're going to split hell wide open without Jesus Christ. But you don't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to go there. You don't have to go there. You see, some will say, well, um, um, 
Well, if, if, if God, and this is kind of the second fallacy that we end up believing, is that how can a loving God send someone to hell? Is the idea of allowing people to go to hell is an unloving act on God's part. I'm going to read this part. If we humans decide that God is somehow wrong to allow unrepentant sinners to pay their deserved penalty, then we have declared that we are more loving than what God is. We have set ourselves up as God's judge and jury, and in doing so, we have closed the door to deeper thinking. And therefore, the first step in answering this question is agree with Scripture that God is love. Therefore, everything He does is an expression of His love. And there was a day in Jerusalem. There was a day in Jerusalem in which the people made a choice. It's in Luke 19. We see that we see Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. I'm going to read this part here. It's in Luke 19 and verse 29. This is what Palm Sunday and also in John 12, which mentions the palms. 29, and it came to pass when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mountain called Ola, that he sent two of his disciples go into the village opposite of you where you may enter and find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat loose it and bring it here and if anyone asks you why are you losing it loosening it thus you shall say to them because the Lord has need of it and so those who sent <clears throat> went their way and found it as they had uh, said to him, but as they were loosening the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosening the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they knew their own, their own uh, put their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on, on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as, as he was drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice of all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. It, was, it would be a sin to praise someone in such a fashion unless they were God. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Amen. Even the stones will cry out. It's our job to praise him. Amen. Praise him. It's our job. And I want you to know here this morning, he's worthy of our praise. He's worthy. He's worthy. You know, Oftentimes, people want to mold God into what they want God to be. Instead of going and reading of how God has revealed himself to us, they want to mold God into what they want him to be. To be. I want you to know here this morning, God is the most gracious, gracious, generous, loving, wonderful, attractive being in the cosmos. He made us with a free will, and he has made us for the purpose to relate lovingly to him and to others. We are not accidents if we fail over and over again to live for the purpose in which he has made, which allows us to flourish more than living in it, than any other way, then God will absolutely have no choice but to give us what we've asked for all along in our lives, which is separation from him. And that is hell. Yes, God is a compassionate being, but he's also just. He's also moral. He's pure. So God's decisions are not based upon modern Western culture or any other culture. It's based upon his nature. Now, this morning you may think to yourself, well, my God would never do such a thing. My God would never send someone to hell. And you're right, your God never would. Because what you've done, my friend, is you've made your own God, which the Bible calls idolatry. It calls it idolatry. And the God you've made up is not the God of the Bible. My father had a t-shirt growing up. He probably still has it, truth be known, probably older than some of the students in here. And on the front, it would say, there's two things certain in life. And on the back, it said, one, there is a God. And two, you're not him. You're not him. And hell is the final sentence that says you refused regularly to live for the purpose in which you were made. 
So on this Palm Sunday, we're reminded of why we praise Jesus. Because of what he saved us from. Because we are nothing more than beggars telling other beggars where to find bread. I praise him because I deserve death and hell. And you should praise him for the same reason. You see, God doesn't want anyone to go to hell. You don't have to go. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to what? To repentance. You can. God believes in hell so much that he let his only begotten son die on the cross for your sins, for my sins. So why do people, why do people blame God? Because when in reality, when you get down to it, God has given the antidote. He has given us the antidote. He has given us the gift and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. What is insane is that people still reject him. They reject him. So here this morning, praise him on this Palm Sunday. Repent on this day of remembrance. And come to Jesus on this day of celebrating of when we came from death and experienced life through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, thankful that you are a loving God. Thank you for listening to today's sermon. To find out more about Southside Baptist and our ministry, visit our website at southsidenow.church. Until we meet again, have a great week.